All right, well, as I mentioned to you, the series is Marriage and Family Matters. This is part five uh, in this series. I want you to turn, first of all, if you will, we're not going to read it right away, uh, but Ephesians chapter five is where we're going to begin as far as uh, reading, uh, as far as turning and reading. I'm going to uh, mention a couple of other verses ahead of time, but as far as turning and reading, we want to go to Ephesians chapter five and, uh, and read our passage there again. Uh, but as I've been uh, sharing with you along this line, I want to start off by giving you a little bit of brief review of some of the things that we've already mentioned to you. I pray uh, that these things have been an advantage to you, have been a blessing to you, have helped you. Uh, I pray that they've not been anything where you felt guilty or condemned over it. How many of you know uh, that none of us are perfect in our marriages? None of us are perfect in our lives. None of us are perfect parents. How many of you know God the Father had two children, Adam and Eve, and he was the perfect father and his two kids rebelled. Isn't that right? And so, uh, you know, again, we do what we know to do with God's help and uh, believe God to take care of the rest. Amen? And so, as a matter of review, I just mentioned these things to you. We talked about this idea uh, of getting back to God's design, getting back to the way God designed marriage to be, the way God designed family to be, because it's only when we follow the way things were originally designed uh, that we're going to succeed. If we're going to uh, do well with anything, we've got to follow the design of it. If you're going to uh, do well with your automobile, you've got to follow the instructions. You've got to get into the owner's manual. You've got to find out uh, what to do uh, when different things take place. You've got to change the oil every now and then. Isn't that right? If that, if that engine's going to last a long time, according to the manufacturer's uh, uh, instructions and whatever, whether it's 3,000 miles, I guess some of them now, they recommend 6,000 miles, whatever the case may be. Uh, you've got to check the tires. You've got to check certain things. Uh, if, you've got a, if you've got a wash machine, you don't, want to, you don't want to use it in a way in which it shouldn't be used. Isn't that right? If you don't operate the way things were originally designed, then you'll do damage to those things. And the same thing holds true to our marriages. Same thing holds true to every relationship. The same thing holds true uh, in terms of our parenting and kids and raising them to be the way God would want them to be, setting an example. We've got to follow the handbook. We've got to follow the owner's manual. And that's what we call the Word of God, the Bible. Amen? Amen. And so one of the scriptures I've shared with you is from Jeremiah 6, 16, the Amplified. It's up on the, on the screen. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the eternal paths. Everybody say eternal paths. And so, again, the prophet Jeremiah is speaking for God. God is saying through the prophet, I want you, Judah, who had been backslid away from God, by the way, I want you, Judah, uh, to go back to the eternal paths where the good old way is. And you know, a lot of times in our world today, uh, people are trying to make a, a new way. Uh, they're trying to design marriage a certain way where there's uh, different ways of marriage. There's different uh, uh, ideas about marriage and, and, and different than the eternal path in the good old way. Uh, but God God says uh, that there's an eternal path in a good old way that as it goes on with this, he says, walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. And so, you know, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of unrest in the world today. There's a lot of uh, thinking that is so messed up. The worldview is increasingly apart from the biblical worldview. But the more we get in line with the biblical worldview, the more our lives will have rest for our souls. The more peace there will be and the less confusion we'll encounter uh, in our lives. Lives. Amen? How many of you know when you are standing on a firm foundation, when you're standing on a firm foundation, you're not shaken by all the things that are going on out there. You're not confused about marriage. You're not confused about gender. You're not confused about sexuality. You're not confused about abortion. You're not confused about things when you're standing on a firm foundation that is based on the Word of God. Are you hearing me here today? But the world is full of confusion. Why? Because the world is walking in darkness. And when you're walking in darkness, you are blind. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we most of us probably know it. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, uh, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. And so those who don't know Christ are blinded. They're walking in darkness. And when you walk in darkness, you can't see where you're going. And you're going to stumble and you're going to fall and you're going to possibly get wounded more and more. And certainly 
Unfortunately, a walk in the darkness will always lead to more wounds and damage in your life. Isn't that right? But God doesn't want us wounded. He doesn't want us damaged in life. He wants us well. He wants us whole. He wants us, he wants us well-rounded. He wants us healthy in every way, uh, whether it be physically, whether it be emotionally, as well as obviously spiritually. He wants us healthy. And the only way to be healthy is to follow the eternal path that God has laid down and follow the good old way, and then there's rest for our souls, and there's health in every area of our lives. Amen? And so we also talked about the idea that marriage is a sacred covenant uh, between a man and a woman. That's the way God instituted it. It's a covenant, and we talked about this idea of covenant, probably not as much as we could and not in the depth that we could, uh, but the idea that it is a binding relationship uh, that is to only be broken by death. It's only to be broken by the ceasing of life. When one dies, that covenant is no longer in effect. Uh, but nevertheless, while both are living, there's a covenant there, and that covenant is something something that is sacred, something that is holy. That's why at one time we called it holy matrimony. Amen? And so it's worth fighting for. Why? Uh, because you know what? This covenant of marriage is a powerful institution. It is powerful and more powerful than what a lot of us recognize. It is so powerful that Satan has done everything he can, and, and maybe there's more he will do in order, to, in order to subvert it, in order to destroy it, in order to uh, break up marriages, in order to ruin families. Satan is afraid of godly families uh, that are walking in the ways of God. Are you hearing me here? And he wants to do everything he can uh, to get you fighting, to get you fussing, uh, to get you all upset with one another. He wants to do everything he can uh, to cause kids to go into rebellion. I'll tell you one thing uh, that is an absolute certainty today. Satan is, is ramped it up in terms of trying to destroy children. I'll tell you, it is ramped up like I never would have ever imagined. It is ramped up mostly in this area of sexuality. But I'll tell you, it is something that, you know, some people say, well, you know, all sin is sin. Well, that does not mean, and never fall for this, that all sin is not equal in terms of the damage it does to people's lives. Are you following me? You know as well as I do. If you think that through, you know, people say, well, sin is sin. Well, not in terms of the damage that it can do in people's lives. I mean, you could steal a pencil, and yeah, that's sin. I mean, th thievery is sin, right? But I'll tell you, there are other things, especially sexual things, uh, that if they are practiced in a perverted way, in a way other than the design that God had, I want you to know that that does damage to the soul. That does damage to the emotions. It does damage to your heart. Are you hearing me here today? And so sin is not all equal. They have different effects upon you and different effects on other people. How many of you know murder is worse than stealing a pencil? Because of what it does to the person you murder, what it does to their family, and what it does to the person who's the murderer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so again, when coming back to the idea of family, it is so imperative that we follow God's design. First, we must learn it. First, we must explore it. Uh, first, we must do everything we can to understand God's design. And then once we do, we need to fight the good fight of faith. Everything we do as believers, we do it by faith. Amen? Not by our feelings, not by our whims. We do it by faith. Because if you do it by feelings and whims, husbands and wives will break up because you don't always feel love. You don't always feel like sticking it out. You don't always uh, uh, you know, want to get along. You don't always uh, uh, want to agree. You don't always want to uh, do everything that you know you need to do in order for that, that marriage to last. No, sometimes you've got to go against what you want by your feelings and you need to walk by faith and not by sight. And I'll tell you, one thing that you do have to do is think of the consequences when it comes to any kind of sin. You know, it really is helpful to think it through and think about what would be the consequences if I followed that through. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, you think about, and, and you know, we're going to talk, talk about where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. How about adultery? Do you know adultery never starts with the action. It starts with the thought life. And so in that thought life of committing adultery, how many of you know that uh, within that thought life, you ought to also consider what the consequences will be? Because people say, well, I won't get caught. You always get caught. Are you hearing me? People always get caught. Your sin shall surely find you out. Is everybody hearing me here? 
And so if that, if that temptation is there, I want you to know, you don't just think about the temptation. Don't think about the adultery. Think about the consequences. It helps set you free from it. Are you hearing me here? The damage it'll do not only to uh, your marriage, but the damage to your children, the damage to your reputation, the damage to other people trusting you. If your wife can't trust you, your husband can't trust you, how can anybody else trust you? Is everybody doing all right? I wasn't planning on this, so we're trusting that this is God, the Holy Ghost, just kind of ministering to each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. How many of you know that saying, and you all do, the grass, all, the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence? Well, you know, I grew up in farm country. You know that. And you know the thing, do you realize if you're looking from one side of the fence, you see how green that grass is? You know what made that grass so green? Well, those cows have been doing certain things in that field that has fertilized that grass. You understand what I'm saying to you? And fertilized grass does turn green, but man, when you're walking in that green grass, you may step in something else too. Are you hearing me here? Is everybody all right? All right, let's go to, uh, we're not going to go to Genesis 2, but we're in Ephesians. But remember this, the first family, I'm still reviewing and then some. I always do that, don't I? And so uh, the four foundational laws based on Genesis 2, as we mentioned, are these. And this is uh, adapted from a book called uh, Marriage on the Rock by Jimmy Evans. I highly recommend the book. I'm not saying it's the best book, but it's a great book. And, and so it'll be a blessing to you. It's a book that I have used for quite a few years now for premarital counseling. And it's not even necessarily meant for premarital counseling. It's meant for marriage. Marriages, but how many of you know uh, that if you're prepared and, and helped ahead of time, it's even better. Isn't that right? And so it's not called marriage on the rocks. We don't want marriage to be on the rocks, but we do want marriage to be on the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so these four foundational uh, laws of marriage are adapted from his book. The law of priority from Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. We dealt with the idea uh, that the marriage relationship needs to be the number one human relationship that there is. Number two, the law of pursuit and be joined to his wife. We are dealing with this law of pursuit even as we speak. I'm going to give you all four. Then we're going to go back and review about what we've already said about the law of pursuit and then add some other things. And then we've got the law of possession, they shall become one flesh. Wait till we get to that one. You'll really enjoy that one. The law of possession. And then fourthly, the law of purity. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You see, many times in the Bible, there's what we call the law of first mention. And here we have a marriage between a man and the woman, the law of first mention. First mention is here. And so from that law of first mention, many times we see a pattern or truths that are, are continued on from there on out concerning that particular subject. And so these four things are something that are kind of a foundation, as we mentioned here, laws of marriage as we glean from this and grow from this and understand this better. Everybody good? All right, now, the law of pursuit. Now, in order to do this, I want us to uh, just uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5, the passage I had you turn to quite some time ago. Didn't know I was going to go into all those rabbit trails. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Notice we're going to start here with verse 22. Now, ladies, remember, don't get all concerned about this word submit. I know people hate that word submit. And we're going to deal with submission, not today, probably next week, uh, we're going to understand it the way God intended it to be understood. And you already know, I'm sure most of you, if you come here at all, you know that submission does not mean domineering or abuse or anything like that. Not the biblical definition, right? Real submission is liberation. Real submission brings freedom. And we all have to submit, don't we? In fact, submission runs the world. We have to submit to authority over us. Isn't that right? That's part of the, 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 the way life is. And so we need to understand this in terms of the family and the institution of the family. So uh, we're going to talk about that probably next week. But notice verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. One guy said, I thought all women are supposed to submit to men. No, it says wives, submit to your own husbands. Own husbands. Not every woman submitting to every man. Verse 23. And again, remember, hold your, don't get upset. We're going to explain that eventually. I'm keeping, you, I'm keeping you on the edge. Keeping you on the edge. All right, so going on with this. For the husband is head of the wife. That's probably as equally not liked. For the husband is the head of the wife. Remember, we're going by God's design, not what man's designed. For the husband is the head of the wife is also Christ, as also. Everybody say, as also. As also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as, everybody say, just as. 
Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as, there it is again, say just as. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, gave himself for her, gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands, verse 28, and this is the second time God exhorts husbands to love their wives. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as, Say, just as, just as the Lord does the church. Notice those two words that eventually we'll probably get to nourishes and cherishes. Those are tender words, aren't they? And husbands are to nourish and cherish their wives. Going on with this, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular, it is husbands again, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So three times in this passage alone, God is emphasizing this, this command for husbands to love their wives. In fact, I shared with you and I, I, I submit to you today uh, that wives are not empowered to submit to a husband that does not love them the way Christ loves the church. Is everybody with me? And so we'll deal with this a little bit more as well. Now, in this law of pursuit, remember now, and be joined to his wife. We uh, define joined as to cling to adhere, to catch by pursuit, to pursue with great energy, and to cling to something zealously. And so we concluded from that uh, that in pursuing, uh, there is work involved. I think everybody would agree with me if you're married that marriage is work. Marriage is work. And so seven biblical ways... The husband is to pursue his wife. I'll just mention a few that we've already done, two that we've done. We've also touched on the third, and we're going to continue in the third. Is everybody doing all right? All right, so seven biblical ways. First of all, the husband is to be the head of the wife. Now, this does not mean, as I said, he's not the dictator. He is not the one who uh, is domineering or abusive or anything like that. It is a leadership type of thing. It is a loving leadership. It is servant leadership. Is everybody with me? Servant leadership, loving leadership is probably a better word than head because people don't understand head. We're talking about leadership. You see a lot of guys today, especially in the world, and maybe religious guys or whatever, uh, and, and even in Islam, and I don't care if that's politically correct to criticize Islam, I'll criticize it all I want to as long as I'm accurate. But Islam treats women just maybe a shade above an animal. I'm talking about in general. I'm talking about, I'm talking about traditional Islam. I know there's different kinds of Islam. I know that there's some Islam that's a little bit more uh, moderate or whatever. They're, they're all in error scripturally, obviously. Uh, but nevertheless, they treat women a little bit above animals. It's all right to beat women in many of their belief systems. It's all right to punish them. It's all right to kill them. I just saw an, uh, an article uh, where a woman was killed because she allowed herself to be raped, and so she was put to death. I, I mean, you know, Islam, you know, any of these women that want to embrace Sharia law and Islam and everything, they don't understand Islam. Islam has put women in bondage for centuries upon centuries. Are you hearing me here? All right, Christianity liberated women in a, in a biblical way uh, because the husband loves the wife, protects her, guides her, helps her, and, and realizes that she has something to add. And as I said to you before, the Bible shows us that both men and women were created in the image and likeness of God and that both men and women are equal in the sight of God as far as their inheritance goes, as far as all that goes. However, men and women are not the same. They have different roles to play. And it doesn't make one of them better than the other. It just means they complement one another. Amen? Amen. And so again, some of you may realize why it's taken seven years for me to talk on this subject to you. Uh, but uh, 
And so headship is important, but it needs to be understood correctly. And then also, secondly, the husband is to be the savior of the wife. Verse 23, comparing Jesus as our savior. And we mentioned to you that savior has the idea of being the deliverer. He's to be her protector. And I mentioned to you last time that there's something innate, something intuitively on the inside of every man that wants to protect his wife, that wants to protect women in general. Uh, there's something about a man that wants to be the protector. And that's why there's been controversy in the past about women being in the military equal to men as far as fighting in the war because there's something in men uh, that are going to want to just by nature want to protect their fellow soldier when they're a woman and, and it might taint their perspective and, and hinder them more than help them. Do you understand that's been part of the argument or part of the reason why uh, there were those that said that women shouldn't be uh, in the military fighting alongside of men like that? It's not because they didn't think men, women could fight alongside of men and fight just as much. In fact, some women might be better than the men at fighting. But the idea is there's something in men that want to always protect and guard, and it just doesn't seem uh, like it's with nature. It's, uh, it seems against nature for that to take place. I hope that you're understanding what I'm saying to you. And then last time we talked about the husband is to love his wife, as we read just now, as Christ loved the church. And we were looking at the love of Christ. What does that look like? What does the love of Christ look like? We mentioned to you that this kind of love, see in the Bible, there are, uh, there are about four different Greek words translated love. And they mean different things. They emphasize different facets. Some of you are probably aware of this, uh, but you know, it's, it's like us, you know, in English, it does not, doesn't do a service sometimes because we could say, well, you know, I love purple carpet and I love my wife. But I better not love the purple carpet the same way I love my wife. Isn't that right? <laughs> but we have this same kind of word. We have the same word. I love peanut butter. And I love my mother. But I better not love my peanut butter the same way I love my mother. Is everybody following what I'm saying to you? But in Greek, you know, it's much more expressive. It, it describes things a lot better. And so there's different words for love. And there's a word, and I may not pronounce them all right, but a Greek word, phileo, which is friendship kind of love. And we have a city right down below us, down in, the, uh, down in Pennsylvania, called Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, phile, phileo, uh, the brotherly kind of love, the friendship kind of love, right? And so there's that kind of love. Then there's this uh, a Greek word, storage, which is the uh, friendship uh, or, or that family, I mean, that family kind of love, the love between, uh, you know, kids and parents and, and that kind of family love, grandparents. Uh, storage is usually used for that kind of love. Then there's eros, which all of you probably know is a sexual kind of love, which is probably the lowest type of love because it's all, you know, so much for fleshly pleasure, but it is ordained of God. It ought to be mixed. How many of you know that it's, if it's biblical, eros kind of love ought to be joined together with phileo love and, and storage love and agape, which is the last one. How many of you know as Christians we have all those forms of love and when eros is coupled together with that, how many of you know it makes for a beautiful thing, right? All right. However, this agape kind of love, this kind of love is God's kind of love. It's a higher level of love. It's an unselfish kind of love. It's a kind of love that doesn't expect anything in return. It's the kind of love that sees people as valuable and precious. It's the kind of love Jesus said, love your enemies and, and pray for those that despitefully use you. You know, love your enemies sounds like a paradox. How do you love your enemies? You can only do it with the love of God. Amen? It's an unselfish kind of love. You love your enemies. It's a higher realm of love. And so that's the kind of love Christ has for us. Us. And that's the kind of love a husband is to first and foremost have for his wife. And again, it brings about a beautiful relationship, really, in so many different ways. And so we mentioned to you, up on the screen, love is a commandment to be, be obeyed. Love is a walk that must be followed. Love is the fruit of the Spirit that must be cultivated. And love is a way to be gone after. We mentioned these things before, just reviewing a little bit. But remember, in 1 Corinthians 12, 30, 31, it says, But earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, remember, in chapter 12, he's talking about gifts of the Spirit. He's talking about tongues and interpretation. He talked about, he talked about working in miracles. He talked about the gift of faith. He talked about uh, ministry gifts, parts of the body. Every body, every uh, a member of the body has a part to play, right? Ministry gifts and what have you. He talked about all those. But then he says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Everybody say excellent way. Let's go over here to 1 Corinthians, if you don't mind. And we're going to build on this just a little bit more this morning in the time that we have. Are you getting anything out of this so far? I pray that you are. And so in 1 Corinthians, and we'll just look at this verse in its context. In verse uh, 27, 
or verse 31 rather. In fact, we can start at verse 27 though. Is that all right? Everybody with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse uh, 27. If you're there, say yes. yes. It says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And so he mentions various ministries, service to the Lord. And then in verse 29, are all apostles? The understood answer is no, not everybody's an apostle. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have the gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues in terms of this ministry gift of tongues with interpretation? The answer is no. Do all interpret? No. But then he said, but earnestly desire the best gifts, but then he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Something that is needed in order for those gifts to function correctly really is what he's about to deal with. Then he says in chapter 13, verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, that's the more excellent way. If I don't have love and I'm speaking in tongues, what's he say here? I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I'm just a bunch of noise. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. He says, you know what? He's basically saying the most important thing is love. The most important attribute is the love of God. That we can do all sorts of things. We can do all sorts of ministry. We can do praise and worship. And, and, and we can do ushering. And we can do children's ministry. And all these things that have become just a, a, a rigorous act of duty and, and working and, and all that kind of thing. But if we're doing it out of love, that love energizes us and, and, and empowers us uh, to do those things in a way in which we could not do otherwise. Isn't that right? And the same thing holds true with marriage and other relationships when it's done in love. That love empowers us. That love enables us to do it in a way where it's not like a burden. It's not something that drags us down. It's not something that uh, messes us up. No, it empowers us because we're doing it out of this love of God. And so I, I, I show you a more excellent way. I said to you last week, you know what? In a marriage, there can be his way. There can be her way. There can be the world's way, but God wants us to do it love's way. God kind of love way. Amen? Because that's God's way. And when we do it, it never fails, which we'll see. Let's read on here in chapter 13. Is everybody all right? It goes on and it says, as we read more, verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but not have love, it profits, profits me nothing. You know, I never understood, though I give my body to be burned. And don't have love, it doesn't profit me. I never understood that. If somebody gives their body to be burned, how is that, you know, on behalf of somebody, how is that not love? But then 9-11 happened. And then I thought, well, those guys, they ran those planes into those, into those twin towers. And they weren't doing it out of love. They were doing it out of selfishness. Because they thought they were going to receive some kind of glory from Allah and some sort of reward from Allah. And so they weren't doing it out of love for anybody other than themselves. A love for themselves, which is selfishness, they did that as well. Are you following what I'm saying? And so going on with this, verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, which is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the one who's coming. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. When who comes? When that which is perfect, the Lord Jesus, we'll see him face to face. And we'll know him. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as also I'm known. Then verse 13, and now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 
And then he goes on talking about pursuing love. Now, again, this goes back to marriage. The idea that three times we read in Ephesians 5 that the husband is to love their wife. So what does that love look like? We saw some descriptions of love. We expounded on some descriptions of love last time. And we're going to expound on it some more uh, in, in this lesson here today as well. All right, so we mentioned a lot of these things. Without love, we're just a bunch of noise. Without love, uh, our understanding and knowledge doesn't mean a thing if we uh, convey it without love. We mentioned how love suffers long. Suffering long uh, has the idea of having a long fuse before you explode, right? You suffer long uh, with people. Love is kind. Kindness is a key. I believe women are looking for kind men. A kindness. The opposite, you could say, of kindness is cruelty. And a lot of these men in history as well as today... They want their wife to submit, but they're cruel. How can they expect a wife to submit to cruelty? They shouldn't. Isn't that right? Is everybody all right? No, kindness, though. Kindness draws a woman to her husband. Praise God. Amen? So there's kindness. Love doesn't envy. Love never boils over with jealousy. Love rejoices when others are blessed. It never begrudges the blessings of others and, and, and a variety of other things with this. Love does not parade itself. Love doesn't try to put itself forward above others. Doesn't step on others in order to rise to the top. And so applying this to marriage. You know, a husband, if he's loving his wife, he's not trying to put himself forward. He's not trying to, uh, you know, make himself the boss. He's not trying to uh, make himself, uh, you know, again, the, the dictator or domineering or anything else. He doesn't parade himself. You know, I think of parading oneself. I, I think of the chest out and the pride. Are you following me here? That's not a loving husband. And it goes along with the next one. Love is not puffed up. And I mentioned to you last time how that has to do with arrogance. And a lot of men uh, are arrogant. I don't know if you noticed that or not. A lot of men are arrogant. Christian men can be arrogant as well, but worldly men, a lot of them are arrogant. I mean, they're just as arrogant. I remember, if I may, you know, my parents are selling their property, right? And when I was there, beginning of the year, right after Christmas, I guess, I was there, and, and I was asked to stay at the house while they went out because a realtor was going to show the house to somebody. This realtor is a, a man. And uh, so he came with them. And see, now he knows more about that land and property than I do now. Because he's been there twice or three times. I roamed those woods for years and years. <laughs> and so how many of you know that you have to bite your tongue? You talk about arrogant. And uh, he's talking about the boundaries. And I said, well, you know, the boundaries are not, are not the way you think. He thought the boundaries meant, well, when the woods ends, the field starts. That's the boundaries. I said, that's not how it works. But did he listen to me? No. Did I force it on him? No. But my point is he was arrogant. He was arrogant. Thought he knew everything and didn't know nothing. Is that all right? But you know, when you're securing yourself, you don't have to argue your case. You don't have to just try to prove your point all the time. Isn't that right? When you're securing yourself, I mean, let the ignorant be ignorant. That's the way I look at it. If he wants to be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I'm not going to fight with him or fuss with him. Is everybody with me here? But you know, a lot of men out there, they're arrogant. And you know what? The Bible says love is not arrogant. Love is not a know-it-all. There's a lot of guys out there that claim to be Christians, and they think they know it all. And they come off like they know it all. And there's been times where people would come here, they're not here anymore, and I don't claim to know it all. I'm still learning. I'm even know I'm still learning, man. We're all still learning. Isn't that right? And if I am asked a question, I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know. I'll do my best to find out, but if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know, because if I tell you I know and I don't know, I look like a fool. I mean, if you know that. And, and so, but man, there's been people over the years, they thought they knew more than the pastor knows, and, and maybe they do. But how many of you know, if they know more and, and they're really walking in love, they don't try to flaunt it. They don't try. I remember a story one time of a pastor who was given a church. The pastor that had been pastoring decided that God was leading him in another area. And, and this guy, he was, he was voted in as the next pastor of the church. But another guy who had more education came to him and said, well, you know what? I should have been voted in as a pastor because you don't qualify like I qualify. You're not uh, educated as much as I'm educated. And so, you know what? You shouldn't even be the pastor of this church. You know what that pastor's response was? The one who did get voted in, he said, well, you know what? It just is not a matter of knowledge or understanding or education. It's a matter of anointing and calling. And that was the end of the conversation. Amen? 
How many of you know you can have all the education in the world, be educated out of your mind? I mean, I believe in education, but how many of you know if you're so educated that you think you know everything, you don't know anything yet? Even, even 1 Corinthians tells us in chapter 8, I believe it is verse 1, anyone who thinks they knows anything doesn't know anything the way they ought to know it. How many of you know God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble? And so they're not puffed up. Husbands, don't be puffed up. Don't be arrogant in your loving of your wife. And then love does not behave rudely. Love has manners, common courtesy. I mean, you know, I was raised to open the door for the, for the wife or the woman, uh, to hold the door. I, and today, I, I mean, you see these young guys, they don't hold the door. They don't do anything. They weren't taught to do that. I think there's something about courtesy and, and manners. It, wouldn't it be nice if we got back to having just good manners? Isn't that right? I'm trying. I'm doing my best. All right. I mean, just common sense manners. But you know as well as I do, common sense is not so common anymore. Amen. And then we talked about briefly, and we're going to expound on it more and go into this. Are you doing okay? This love does not seek its own. It does not insist on its own rights or its own way. And so a husband who walks in love, loves like Christ did, is not going to be selfish He's not going to insist on his own rights or his own way. And so selfishness defined. Now we're getting into all new stuff. I know I've already said some new things with review, but now we're getting into all new stuff. Selfishness defined is this, concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. How many of you know a man, a husband who's like that cannot expect a woman to submit one iota to him? Because he's out for himself. He's out for himself. And then another definition from the dictionary Bible themes, a self-centered concern for oneself without due regard to the needs of others. Scripture treats selfishness as an aspect of sin and urges believers to care for others as well as themselves. Let's look at some scriptures. Notice Philippians chapter 2, 3, and 4. Paul says by the Holy Spirit, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. That's a tough one, isn't it, sometimes? Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's love. That's the God kind of love. Notice again, I shared this with you last week. I'm giving it to you again. James 3, 13 through 15. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts... Do not boast and lie against the truth. That's an interesting phrase. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, and it is sensual, and it is demonic. Earthly, sensual, and demonic. What is? What kind of wisdom is? The wisdom that is self-seeking in your heart. The wisdom that brings up bitter envy. The wisdom uh, that lies against the truth is what? It's earthly, sensual, demonic, and it brings demonic activity into the home. Strife brings demonic activity into the home. Selfishness will always bring demonic activity into the home. And so the opposite of that would be when you're unselfish, when you're loving like God loves, when you're loving as Christ loved the church. How many of you know that can bring, uh, that can bring the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the home? The Holy Spirit moves in the home when there's peace, when there's love in that way. There's that joy of the Lord. All these various things. And we want the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in our homes. Amen? Notice what Jimmy Evans said in Marriage on the Rock. He said, nothing in this world can endear a man to a woman more than the equality of sacrificial love. By the same token, nothing can embitter a woman's spirit more than a selfish or abusive man. Our society presently is reeling from the effects of the abusive and selfish men of today and from the recent past. When men change, so will our society. And so, you know, when it talks about, when, we, when people talk about this idea, well, I just wish she'd change. I just wish that person would change. How many of you know, first of all, you can't change anybody. But I'll tell you, change in a home begins with the husband. Change in the home begins with the father. If the husband and the father is not going to make a change, it's going to be difficult for change to take place. However, if you are a lady married to an unsaved or uh, unbelieving husband or a husband that's just carnal, whatever it is, you have to do what you can do and trust God the rest of the way and pray for him. But real change happens, man, when husbands decide, I'm going to change and I'm going to move with God and I'm going to go the eternal path and I'm going to love my wife the way Christ loves his church. 
Man, then you're going to have, you're going to have change. And you're going to have change that will glorify God and change that will minister to your family and change that will cause kids to rise up and they're going to love Jesus, they're going to serve Jesus and they're going to fulfill the plan that God has for their lives as well. Amen? Amen. And so it begins with men. Now, love is the next one. Love is not easily provoked. So we're still talking about love. We're talking about husbands. Love your wives. An attribute of this kind of love is it is not easily provoked. The word means to irritate or arouse to anger. All right, so love is not easily provoked. When a person walks in love, they're not touchy, irritable, and easily angered. And so, you know, a lot of, and, and a lot of times I think that this is, uh, this is like a disease in our families today. I mean, they see it exemplified on television. They see, you know, fathers are belittled on television and, and even sons. Have you noticed? I mean, the fathers look like the fool so often. And, and again, this goes back to that point I made before that Satan wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy families. He wants to give uh, an image uh, of families that is contrary to the way it really is. And in some ways with Hollywood, you know, Hollywood claims, or they have claimed in the past, well, we're just reflecting the way culture is. No, let me say something. They are not just reflecting the way culture is. They are trying to show culture the way they want it to be so that minds begin to change and become more and more the way their perverted minds think. Are you following what I'm saying to you today? I don't know what world they're living in, but they're not living in the same world I am. And so when a person walks in love, they're not touchy. Men, don't be touchy. Don't be irritable. You say, how can I not be? Well, first of all, you got to trust God. We walk by faith and not by sight. We ask God for help. Everything as believers, we have no excuse. We have no excuse uh, to do anything other than what. When God gives command, he gives the ability and power to fulfill that command. Isn't that right? He doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't leave us powerless. And so when a person walks in love, they're not touchy, fretful, and resentful. In fact, this scripture came to mind. Is that all right? Is, that, is everybody doing all right? Go back to Ephesians 5 just for a minute. I don't have any illusions that I'm going to finish my message today. I was going to get into a lot more than what we have time for, but you know what? Thank God. That's the beauty of pastoring. I'll be back next week. How about you? <laughs> Amen. Because next week we want to talk about, we're going to talk about things uh, that are going to be very, very important for all of us in terms of love, characteristics of love. We're still on this particular pursuing or this type of pursuing and loving our wives. And again, if you're, if you're a woman, this applies to you because you know what? We're all to walk in love, aren't we? Right, And these are all attributes of the love walk, no matter whether it's a husband to the wife, but we're focusing on that aspect of it as well. And, and you know, we want to get into uh, some things that are going to be, I think, very helpful. We're going to talk about integrity. We're going to talk about the necessity of integrity. Why? Because love rejoices in the truth. Truth is honesty and integrity. We're going to have to get in that next week because time is a waste. And I'm not going to hurry through anything, but notice Ephesians 5. Notice Ephesians 5, verse 15, Paul by the Spirit says this, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, remember later on, verse 22 starts talking about husbands and wives specific, doesn't it? And so we're right in that same, that same context. We're right there. Now notice verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, to which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Everybody say, filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart. So we got worship. We got being filled with the Spirit. Giving thanks to God always for all things to God the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. I want to submit to you today that in order for us to have families the way God wants, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We need the filling of the Spirit of God in our lives. We need to be worshipers of God. We need to be those that are uh, in the Word of God, worshiping God, spending time with God, because our relationship with God will be in direct proportion, or shall I say our relationship with others will be direct proportion to our relationship with God. Isn't that right? And so to be filled with the Holy Spirit is so important, to just have more of His influence uh, in our lives in order to be the best husbands we can be, to be the best wives we can be, to have the best kids we can have. We've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence that he includes that in this. So love is not easily provoked. Well, if you're filled with the Spirit, how many of you know you won't be easily angered? Going on with this, you know, many things about anger. I've shared this not long ago, back in the fall. Uh, the first murder was a result of misdirected, and uncontrolled anger. A man who doesn't control his anger is called a fool. Number three, a man who doesn't exercise control is defenseless. So what that's saying is this, that when you don't have control over anger, you open yourself up to the adversary. You open yourself up to attack from our enemy. Are you hearing me here? All right, so we need to be watchful of this uncontrolled, misdirected anger. We need to be careful about this idea of being easily provoked and irritable and touchy because when we're that way, we open the door, not only to our own lives, but to our family's lives, to our marriages, uh, when we allow anger uh, to rule and reign over our lives. And going on with this, number four, a strong man is a man who is slow to anger. Slow to anger. Anger is not always wrong. But it is when it's misdirected and out of control. Out of control, anger is always sin. We can be angry at the things God is angry with. We can be anger, angry at injustice. We can be angry at sin and all these things, but we cannot let it be misdirected or out of control. The Bible, number five, tells us not to befriend an angry man. Number six, and I think of an angry man, the movie, if you were there last Friday night, I mean the father was an angry man. Number six, the Bible tells us that anger is learned and can be contagious. And man, this is where you need to watch out, fathers, mothers as well, but fathers is whom we're addressing more than any. Anger uh, uh, shown forth by you in a way that is ungodly will be, be something that your kids are apt to lay hold of and it'll be contagious. If you've got angry kids, look at yourself. Look at yourself. If you've got kids that are out of control with anger, look at yourself. I'm not saying it's always the case, but I think that's the first place to look. Are, are you following me here? Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, if you ever watch mystery movies, you know, I, I always, I don't always, but many times I guess the murderer in these murder mystery movies. I almost always guess the murderer. Not always. My wife will tell you not always, but I often do. And you see, if a spouse gets killed, how many of you know that 99.9% .9 of the time it's the other spouse? If your child is out of control with anger, the first place to look is yourself. Amen? Are you following me here? Amen. Number seven, those in leadership should not be easily angered. It's against that leadership mode. It's against that leadership quality. James chapter 2, it says this, verses 19 and 20. It says, understand this. This is the Amplified. Understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear. Husbands, be quick to hear. Quick to listen. A ready listener. You know, one thing I found out, I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm working hard. I found out that wives just want their husbands to listen sometimes. And, and you know, we have this idea that we've always got to fix things. We always got to fix it. And, and so, you know, a lot of times wives are not interested in you fixing it. They don't even care if you can fix it. What they want you to do is listen. Listen to them. And so you learn to listen, and I mean really listen. I don't mean, you know, just stand there like a dummy, and then when she says something, you wake up. You understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> I'm talking about learning to listen, and even asking God, God, help me to listen. It's like I've shared with you before, when my wife wants to talk, I say, is this a long story or a short story? <laughs> if it's a long story, I need a big cup of coffee. I need a strong cup of coffee. And one thing she'll tell you, if it's about money, she wants to go through finances. Finances bore me. I got to tell you, they bore me. And if she wants to talk about finances, I say, I got to have two big cups of coffee, all right? <laughs> no, just kidding there. But anyway, we need to learn to be listeners. We need to on purpose decide we're going to listen to what they say. It helps them, and if it helps them, it's helping you. Just remember that. Isn't that right? There is something to that, to that phrase, happy wife, happy life, folks. I'm telling you right now. But they just want you to listen. And sometimes all we want to do is we want to fix it. We don't even want to listen to the whole situation. We want to try to fix it right away. And, and we need to listen to them. And if we'll listen, we will avoid so many issues and problems down the road. Are you following me here? So understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak. Everybody say slow to speak. Because you know what? If you're listening, you're not speaking. Isn't that right? If you're listening, you're not talking. And if you're really listening, you're not trying to really, while they're talking, try to think about what you're going to say after they're done talking. You're listening to them. 
Sometimes people think or, or they, they, they try to be listening or they look like they're listening, but in reality, they're looking for a comeback. They're looking for, they're looking for something to come back with. Are you hear what I'm saying? But they're not really listening. They're trying to strategize. They're trying to come up with a strategy. How am I going to respond to this? Are you following what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I've lived a little bit of life here, all right? All right. So, so let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, and slow to take offense and to get angry. For man's anger does not promote the righteousness God wishes and requires. And so again, these exhortations from God, if we love, we are not easily provoked to anger. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Are you glad that he's slow to anger? Yes. I mean, I'm so glad that Jesus is slow to anger. I'm so glad that God's uh, anger comes slowly, that his mercy endures forever, and, and that his anger is only for a moment. Aren't you glad for that? Amen? And, and he's slow to anger. If he wasn't slow to anger, he'd have wiped us all out by now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If he wasn't slow to anger, you would have thought by now that he would have obliterated everybody who believes in abortion and killing babies if he wasn't slow to anger. But thank God he's slow to anger. He is long-suffering because he desires all men to be saved. And husbands are to love their wives in a way that they don't get angry, they don't fly off the handle, they don't get all upset, they listen, they're slow to speak. How many of you know that's wisdom from above? Amen? Wisdom from above. Well, let's pray. And I'd like the musicians to come if you would. Let's pray. I, I've said enough today. I didn't say near as much as I wanted. But again, next week we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about integrity. We're going to talk about truth. We're going to talk about the need for husbands to walk in integrity of heart. We're going to look at from the scriptures some of the things the Bible says about integrity. How many of you know we don't hear a lot about integrity today? Some of you may not even know what integrity means. So look it up in the dictionary between now and next Sunday. That's your assignment, all right? But we'll define it. But integrity, why? Because love does not rejoice in iniquity, but does rejoice in the truth. And integrity is truthfulness and honesty. Amen? If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos coming in the future. And thank you so much, and God bless. <laughs>